Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Elena Tinney, and I'm Senior Art Lab Facilitator at Van PFA. Welcome to today's talk with Loretta Henry, Francis Porter, Terry Green, and Lakita Tummings of the African American Quilt Guild of Oakland. Today, we are honored to get the opportunity to host these quilters to hear about the process behind their work and their journey in quilting. If you have any questions along the way, feel free to just write them in the Q&A section below and they'll be read and answered at the end of the talk. Without further ado, let me pass the mic to Loretta Henry of the AAQGO. Hello, everyone. How are you? First of all, I'd like to thank the museum for giving us this opportunity to share some information about our guild. And could you go to next? Thank you. Uh, this is our 25th anniversary of the guild. And so we, we're so excited to be able to share information about our guild and to highlight the work of three of our members. Next. Our guild was founded over 20 years ago by a wonderful lady named Esther Poncho. She taught uh, quilting at a senior citizen uh, organization and decided that she wanted to extend that craft beyond just teaching. So she got together with seven other ladies and they formed a group. Uh, they were Afri African-American, so they called it the African-American quilt group, but they decided they didn't wanna be like a sewing circle. So they put in the name, they just became a guild, which was, is a group that's dedicated to uh, preserving the craft and keeping the high standards and educating its members. Uh, next. And so we have meetings to help to share our knowledge. Next, please. And we have lots of activities. It's a wonderful group. We have lots of com uh, lots of friendship. Okay, next. The name Oakland, of course, because we are located in or Oakland, but it reflects the diverse population of the city itself. Our membership is open to anyone. We have male members also. So anybody, you know, fill out the the membership form and, and that's, you can become a member of our guild. Next. The guild, part of uh, Ms. Poncho's mission was not only to uh, help the craft, but to extend knowledge, to share. So we often go out to other groups like the senior citizen next. We do programs at live public libraries. We work with elementary schools next. Every February, we have a major event. It's a, called our family workshop where uh, every families come in together. Uh, they're each given a bag with different sewing items and then they can pick out a, a, a mini quilt that they're going to hand sew next. And, they're act and the members of the guild will sit with the families and show them how to uh, make a, a nine patch quilt. And even for the little ones, as you can see in the upper right hand corner who can't sew, they will be given a card and they can paste down, make a, a paste down their fabric to make their own little quilt. Next. The other thing that Ms. Poncho wanted to do beside outreach was we, when we have exhibits, our exhibits are not juried. Every quilt is our best quilt. We had, we've exhibit quite all around the Bay Area. One of our exhibits, for example, called The Neighborhoods Coming Together, was featured at the National uh, Quilt Museum in Kentucky. It included 100 quilts. They were quilts made not only by members of the Guild, but we had quilts from elementary schools and different other groups. Next. If you'd like some more information about the Guild when this is over, if you go to our website at aaaqgo.org, you can find any, just about anything you'd like to know about the Guild. I would really, I'm so happy that we were able to present three members of the Guild uh, and we're going, they're going to introduce themselves and then tell something about their work. So we're gonna start with Francis Porter. Good morning. I am African-American Quilt Guild, Oakland, Francis Porter. I 
I learned to sew my first dress as a child, continuing to sew for many years using textiles, textures, and color at the forefront. There were no quilters in my family. At age 82, my first introduction to quilting, the Guild's second president, the late George Johnson, brought her quilt show to our Black History activity. Next. Joy offered to teach a beginning class in quilting. Well, I wasn't interested because I wasn't old enough. But two years later, Joy again was invited by our, our um, Black History Coordinator, Gloria Taylor, who again, Joy invited us to be taught quilting. Well, I guess I was old enough this time because I accepted and I learned to sew under this master quilter. I have now quilted as gifts and donated for fundraisers over 100 quilts. Next. I am indebted to Joy not only for her teaching, but her encouragement to expand my journey by entering a quilt, the Underground Railroad, into the Alameda County Fair. The fair quilt jurors critique made me feel like a pin cushion. Uh, but the next year, I wasn't deterred. I entered another quilt with all the critiqued items noted called watermelons galore. Next. This quilt was awarded first place in a local African-American newspaper arranged by my friend, Sandra Williams. And Sandra has remained supportive of me on my journey, encouraging me along the way. I have continued to donate and to share my quilts at the fair, having won several seconds and honorable mentions at the fair. And this is why I quilt. Next. I have used the Underground Railroad quilt to educate children in kindergarten, fifth graders, and the California Cross Point High School with 200 Chinese students in assembly. And they've been taught about quilting and its role in enabling slaves to escape. Sander arranged this visit to the high school, providing the necessary tools and pre-cut fabrics. Kindergartners and fifth graders are taught the art of quilting. Oops, that's why I quilt. I'm up next. Next, next. I am a proud member for 77 years of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, founded in 1908. I mentioned this since it's important as to why I quilt. Our mission is service to all mankind. I donate quilts for scholarships, fundraisers, and I volunteer for many activities. My donation of the quilt, Irresistible, was in a, one in a silent auction for somewhere between $200 and $400 for scholarships for college bound, bound I'm sorry, students. The AKAs and the Guild enabled me to socialize develop sisterhood and friendships, remain alert, active, and involved. That's why I quilt. Next. My quilts range from sizes mug rug, infant, twin, and queen. 
techniques used include adapting free traditional patterns, bought patterns, paper piecing, raw edge quilting, stencils, and computer generated images. Artist sculptor Joe Sam, with his permission, allowed me to use his computer generated images in public art off the wall, which was exhibited in Oakland's City Hall and published in the Guild's Neighborhoods Coming Together, Quilts Around Oakland. Participation in exhibits is gratifying, and that's why I quote. As a docent for 20 years at the Oakland Museum of Art, next please, I have memories of some of the collections, especially still life, landscape, and modern art. And one such item is Myrtle the Turtle. And of course, I added a flower to Myrtle and pearls to her necklace. And that quilt included raw edge quilting. Next, as mentioned, the guild is multicultural, multi-ethnic, and loaded with amazing talent, as you will see in quilts by Terry Green and Laquita Cummings. My journey as to why I quilt was enhanced by guild member, my mentor, the third president, the late Marion Coleman. In 2018, Marion was nominated by Guild member Ora Clay and awarded an NEA National Heritage Fellowship. The quilt, at least the cover scene of the Heritage Program is a selfish quilted by Marion. Marion's legacy to the Quilt Guild provides international exposure as indicated in the chapter entitled, Each One, Teach One. It's an international publication by Melanie Fallock, Making a Life, Working by Hand. Being included and in receiving this recognition is why I quit. Next. Marion challenged guild members to design a quilt or quilts for the publication mentioned. I draw only toothpick features. And I thought, I can't do this. But then I remembered that I am both intrigued, but I abhor the graffiti that I have seen not only locally, nationally, but internationally. But I wonder, why is it that the alphabet figures that I see in the graffiti seem to be all done by one person? And so I Googled graffiti alphabets and I found many images. And so in my quote, is graffiti art? I used some of these images to make stencils, which I used newspapers to draw and cut out. I bought stencils and each letter seen in Is Graffiti Art was cut three times. The original in fabric, the fusing, and of course, the ones that I had cut. And I then ironed on and stitched each letter individually to form this quilt. The question, is graffiti art, is best viewed in the, in the art as art in the eye of the beholder. My, next please. 
my journey was expanded nationally with inclusion of is graffiti art with other quilts of other members of the guild and the exhibit previously mentioned at the National Quilt Museum in Paducah, Kentucky. Marion had communicated in advance that I would be visiting the museum. And so you see, what you see is the director of the museum, the curator, and one other member because they wanted to see who was this person who was 92 years old, but didn't look it. And so I ended up giving a tour, not only to staff members, but to other visitors at the museum. This quilt is graffiti art, along with Marion Coleman's, whoops, I've gotten the name, this little cowboy picture by Marion Coleman. I can't recall the name, but that's okay. If I don't remember it, it'll pop up later. Anyway, those two quilts were requested and entered into an exhibit at the Texas Quilt Museum in LaGrange, Texas. That again is why I quilt. Next, my journey was expanded. Next. Oh, I'm sorry. Our current president, Marie DeForest Taylor, challenges members annually to make a quilt to be exhibited in various venues around Oakland. And prior to COVID-19 and decluttering closets, I designed my quilt, No Mo Heels. Drawing from shoe designer Jimmy Chu, Jimmy Chu, I lined my five inch heels in red. Marie's challenges stimulate my creative juices. At our monthly meetings, her agenda allows time for show and tell, which I've never outgrown. And this is why I quit. And finally, the gratification felt in sharing projects, for making quilts for family and friends, and for continuing to provide fundraising services and other donations of my quilts. I am grateful to the ladies mentioned who assisted me on my journey of why I quilt. And to my daughter, Lisa Porter Thompson, who made my visits to the museums in Kentucky and Texas possible. And Terry Green, it's your turn. Thank you, Francis. So why do I quilt? Um, it's interesting, Francis said this before, no one in my family quilted. And the only quilt that I ever saw was one that was in my grandmother's closet and it was all folded up. And it used and it was something that had been hand quilted and it just surprised me it was like oh my gosh um why is it why is it on the floor so when i started doing quilting i quilt now on purpose and for a purpose usually i'm inspired by something either something that i want to learn a new technique or it's a gift for a family member or a friend or I just quilt just for fun. Next. I started quilt, I started sewing actually eight years old. I made Barbie doll clothes um, by pattern. Um, some of us are old enough to remember when Barbie dolls had patterns that you could buy and they were just like regular clothes and all the little pieces and we couldn't afford to buy uh, fabric, so I went dumpster diving at a place near my aunt's house for fabric. I sewed for most of my life up until college. I even worked in New York fabrics, but I still didn't quilt. Next. The first quilt that I ever made was when my daughter um, was born in, uh, 19 years ago. 
And I said, okay, I'll make a baby quilt. And I went to our local quilting store and took a class. And it was probably the hardest thing that I've ever done in my life. Um, you know, when you look at this quilt, some of the points don't match up, the lines are not straight, but I love this quilt. And it's one that I still have today. I, my daughter doesn't even have it, I keep it. Next. The second quilt I made was an underground railroad. And my mom and I went to um, a local quilt store and they had a class and there were several of us from our, my church, um, a few other people, we all took this class together and I made the Underground Railroad quilt. Interesting enough, my mom liked this quilt so much that she's probably made about 10 of them and she's given them to her, her kids and grandkids. This, um, we have continued quilting uh, for probably the last 15 years, my mom and I, and one of the pieces that was commissioned um, or we were requested to make was for a church in Sacramento and they wanted a cross and so ended up doing this cross and it was so, um, I would say fulfilling because I got a chance to visit the church and they had actually framed the quilt, put it behind glass and put it in their prayer room. Next. One of the other things I like to do or love to do are photo quilts. And so um, the first one that, well, the first one I did is actually the one that's blue and yellow. And I did it for my mom. It was for her 80th birthday and it has my mother, her parents, her sisters and brothers, her kids, and some of the grandkids. And then later I did one for my husband and he wanted to, again to have his family members. So it's him, it's us, it's our kids, his, his sisters and brothers and his parents. I think doing photo quilts um, certainly you to leave a legacy, kind of a family history. Um, usually we have the photographs in a photo album when we don't look at them but here you have a quilt and now you have pictures of your family to pass on. But it does leave a legacy for the people we love. Next. I joined the African-American Quilt Guild of Oakland probably about 11 years ago. It may have been longer than that. And here's where the fun comes in. This is a great bunch of quilters. Um, we have retreats, there are challenges, there's community service, um, but there's such an incredible talent of quilters who are so willing to share their expertise. And this was um, one of the first times doing an art quilt under the direction of Marion Coleman um, for the Neighborhoods Coming Together um, exhibit. And I created a Baybridge quilt um, for this exhibit and what was interesting is that the original one was sold. Um, it was hanging up in a gallery in Oakland and it was sold. And then Mary let everybody know that, hey, um, these are gonna go to the National Quilt Museum in Paducah. And so probably within a couple of weeks, I reproduced the quilt. I made another one um, so that it could get, uh, it could go as part of the exhibit. And um, it also, hung at, I, I think it was Pacific International Quilt Festival. Um, but that was so much fun, so much talent. I mean, Marion guided us and it, it just was an incredible opportunity. I really wish that this entire collection of quilts as part of the neighborhoods coming together could exhibit um, somewhere in Oakland or Berkeley or, or somewhere because it's such, a phenomenal piece of work um, from the Guild that um, it really should be seen again. And, you know, one in particular that I always love is the, the uh, one, a piece done by Jackie Houston of the Guild, Hands Up, Don't Shoot. And then also my mom did a replica of El Capinel building at Mills College. But if you just see the body of work from this um, collection of, um, neighborhoods coming together, you'd just be amazed as well. And again, most of us that worked on some of the quilts were traditional quilters, not art quilters. And so that just led us on a different journey. 
Um, next slide, please. In 2019, I participated in a year-long monthly workshop with Sue Fox, um, where you would make one piece of art work each month for 12 months. Uh, several uh, guild members participated in prior years and I saw their finished work and I really got interested. And so this workshop um, coordinated by Sue Fox included artists from all over the Bay Area most of them were not quilters. Um, some of them were did painting, they did ceramics, photography. But what Sue did was to challenge us to create and be creative. And each month she would give us the challenge. And so I ended up um, trying my hand at making portrait quilt blocks. And at the end of the day, at the end of the year, we we had a show at Bay Quilts in Richmond and it was so much fun. And so what you see um, are some of the quilt blocks that I did uh, for this particular um, show. Next. So um, getting back to being on and for a purpose, uh, in 2019 in particular, I was really troubled and inspired by some of the events that were going on um, in the world. And I did a series of blocks um, called Reality Check. And in this one, I was particularly bothered by all the gun violence that was going on, um, some of the Black Lives Matters issues that were being raised. There was the whole Karen syndrome that was going on and, and also a little the lies that were being told by the former president. But this block um, in particular is titled Guns Don't Kill, People Do. And so now I guess I need to update it to include, you know, going grocery shopping and going to spas. But um, right now, you know, sometimes my quilting just involves getting out feelings that I have about historic events and current events that are going on that I just have to do something and say something and then I can put it away. But this particular quilt, there were four blocks. Um, I was, this one got a chance to be exhibited at the D. Young Museum. So I was really happy and surprised about that. Next. So going back to the Quilting Guild, um, when we, received the 20 by 20 challenge. So it was the 20th anniversary of the guild and we needed to make a block that was 20 by 20. And I started thinking about what is it about the guild that I really love? And besides all the people, and it made me think about just the diversity of the quilters, the diversity of the women. And of course we have men and I probably should update this to include men. But I started designing this quilt and I found um, a piece of clip art on Etsy. Actually, I bought it um, and got permission to use it. But I found this piece and modified it and created my block celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Guild. And so next um, slide. Initially, when I shared it to a, a Facebook group called Black Girls Quilt, by the way, that has over 6,000 members to get some feedback about the background color. Um, based on the responses, I changed it to the green sherbet. And so the rest is history. So here was my contribution to the Guild's 20th anniversary. And it's one that I quilted myself and embellished as well. Um, so I was really happy about that. Next. So an, another reason I quilt, again, gifts for people and one of, I call her my niece, but my niece um, was having a baby, her first baby, and asked my mom and I to make her a quilt. So after we sat down and talked with her um, at my mom's house, we just sat down and we kind of drew out what we thought the quilt would, should look like. And what I remember about it, and I'm always trying to tie a quilt that I make for somebody to that person, is that this baby was going to be surrounded by so much love. So I just wanted to have these heart shapes on, on the quilt and um, just to remember. And so this was the beginning of the quilt, this 
part of the end of the quilt and on each um, quilt that I make, especially ones that I gift, I try to put a label on it. Um, let's see, next. Oh, go back once. So can you go back there? Yeah, so this, this particular quilt and the story ended up being, I was able to share the story in Quilt Folk Magazine, um, I think it was back in October. And so it was just something that I was really happy about, but just showing the process, you know, a lot of times we make quilts by pattern. I do sometimes use a pattern, but a lot of times I'm just designing what's in my head or what I'm uh, led to believe is, is, should be done for this particular quilt. Um, next. So um, just recently, um, back in May with the pandemic and everything going on, I, I started my journey of machine embroidery and I've made three quilts thus far, but this particular one is one that I did for my auntie. It was her 95th birthday and she is the of the church lady, the church hats, the church dressing. And so I really wanted to do something special for her. Next. So here's here's the um, entire quilt. Um, it has all the hats because she she's definitely a hat lady, but it also has um, scripture verses, Bible verses um, included. And what's interesting about this particular quilt, or at least my auntie, is that um, my auntie is 95 years old. She her mother quilted and made quilts for her entire family but Aunt Emma never learned how to quilt. And there's only one quilt that she has that was from her mother and she gave it to me. And that quilt is all hand pieced and hand stitched. It's, it's just absolutely beautiful. And so I needed to make something really special for Emma in exchange for the quilt. So this is what I gave her. Next. So another reason why quilt is for a purpose, and I'm currently working with Sarah Trell at the Social Justice Sewing Academy, and Sarah and her team work in the school system, the prison system, community centers to make blocks that focus on social justice issues. And one of her latest um, projects is the Remembrance Project, where they um, folks are making quilts of people who were victims of violence, whether it was gun violence or, or some other kind of um, violence. And she looks for volunteers. She has a group of volunteers that make blocks, they embroider the blocks, they long arm the blocks. And like me, I help to finish them by um, completing the binding so that the banners can um, be hung in various places. Next. So this is just an example of one of the ways that you can give back or quilt on purpose. And while I'm not making these blocks, it certainly is um, cause to help finish these blocks. Next. So she has um, a database, unfortunately, of over 4,000 people who have been victims of violence. So if you're looking for a worthy cause project and you either want to make a block or embroider or help finish, um, look up the Social Justice Sewing Academy on Instagram or their website. Next. And while I have ventured into making art quilts, I still do like make, making traditional quilts. And my latest was um, a, a double wedding ring from a class that I took and started with um, Jeanette Walton, who is also a guild member and an incredible paper piecing talented person. Um, I started this quilt in February of 2017, um, got really frustrated making it, put it down, started it back up um, during the pandemic. I finally finished it in March of this year. Um, after, and I sent it out and had it um, custom quilted and, and finally finished it. But this particular quilt has 36 rings, four blocks each, and a total of 3,456 individual pieces. 
Um, it was definitely a challenge. Next. And so it was the, I've had a lot of quilts um, quilted, but this was the first time I had one that was custom quilted. And um, if you ever get a chance to do it one time, <laughs> It's, it's a wonderful thing, but I mailed it to a long armor in Tennessee and um, she worked with me through Zoom um, and we just walked through how she should um, custom quilt it. So I was really happy about that, but it's also one of the only three quilts that I've ever hand stitched the binding on and because I, I only do by machine. Um, next, but yeah, this one is a keeper. I, I love it. I'm going to keep it. I think I'm going to gift it to anyone. <laughs> but um, I finally did finish it. I'm really happy. Next slide. So again, why I quilt, I usually quilt on purpose, with a purpose, and to have fun. And something that I think Francis said earlier was each one teach one. And so we, it, I think it's a great idea. And also I'm so thankful to so many people who have reached out to help you either through Facebook groups. Um, Benet helped me and Mary Wright helped me with embroil. I can think of countless people, Ann Robinson, Jackie Houston, Dolores in the Guild who have helped me with just, but at the end of the day, it's all about having fun and I love it. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Lakita Tummings and um, she could talk about why she quilts. Okay, so I'm up. My name is Lakita Tummings and I've been quilting for a really, really long time. Um, I've been creative all my life. All of my siblings are creative. My grandmother quilted. My mother taught me how to sew when I was probably like 10 and and I have what is commonly known as a craft addiction. Anything that's colorful catches my eye and, and that's, that's what I do. So I like the satisfaction of creating the things that I see in my mind. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm not gonna talk as much as those other ladies. I'm really gonna show you what the things that the quilts that I've created. So we're gonna look at some of my quasi, traditional quilts, some of the stuff that I've done. Most of my quilts are my own design. I hand piece, I hand applique, and I hand quilt. I don't have any machine rendered quilts at all. So everything you see, I've done by hand. Um, and along the way, I'm gonna talk about, you'll see the colorful stuff that I've done and how I've kind of transitioned my creativity, how I, was thinking of things two dimensional and then how do I, I think about things. So I took a, to digress, I took a class with a woman named Susan Ellis and she was using fabric as a medium of sculpture. And that has kind of tweaked what I do when I quilt. So I'm gonna show you my first couple of quilts. They're kind of traditional and I'm not, again, I'm not gonna spend as much time chatting about them. So you'll get to see them and then we can move from there. So next. First quilt I ever made, you can see how the black cotton fabric has disintegrated. That quilt was made in 1976. And again, it's all piece by hand. The polyester salmon pieces have held up really well over the years. The rest of it, not so much. Next. This quilt is called My Heritage. I did a lot of fussy cutting. It's based on a quilt that I saw when I was 17 and my grandmother had made it, but we didn't, I didn't bring the quilt home, but this is kind of the result of that. And that's the reason why I quilt. I saw the quilt she made and I was very excited about it, but this is kind of my take on it. Next, gold thread. You can't really see it here, but again, I was doing kind of my own thing. There are faces all around and there are actual images that I took from a book about African fabric that are kind of embedded in that. Next. So this is just another view. And again, it's based on a traditional broken star pattern for the quilters. You kind of get the idea that that's what that is. Next. 
This is the information on the back of the quilt. Next. This one is applique. I really am not a linear person. I don't think linear. I like curved lines. So I prefer applique because it allows me to create those curved lines. So this is a really big quilt. It's the largest quilt that I have ever made. It's 109 by 90 inches. It's really big. Next. And again, this is embroidery. Again, as a, as a person who has a craft addiction, anything that's colorful will grab my attention. And it's, it's from Matthew 6. Next. This is, again, a kind of traditional aspect. It is based on the Baltimore album quilts. I, didn't, I wasn't really a fan of the white background. I prefer the black because the colors pop. Most of these blocks are my own invention. Um, I want to say like maybe four of them or not. Next. So again, the details that are in there. I like flowers too, because flowers are colorful. Next. And again, back to that metallic thread. It's really a pain to sew with, but it just gives a detail. Next. So then I started thinking about how, because of how I process, I always look at things as being interconnected. And when I was doing very traditional quilts, I had a tendency to do all over designs because everything is related. So you can kind of see all the different elements and again, more applique. And to my mind, it's kind of traditional, but it's really kind of not. Next. This is a close up. Next. So again, back to applique, still in that kind of looking at what I'm creating, looking at my own creativity, how you kind of move through this process for me. So this is called the spirit of a woman, next. And this is just a detail. And I'm beginning to incorporate kind of 3D elements. You can kind of see the beading around some of it, next. And this is the information on the back. Next. So the other thing that I have a problem with is shoes. I stopped counting at 99 pair. I have a lot of shoes. So this is fetish footwear, because again, it, it, you can't go big, go home. So it's a bag, you can see all the shoes, and they are basically based on shoe designs of that time. Next. My niece saw that, saw that quilt and she wanted a shoe quilt as well. So this is called Nikki's Closet because this is, that's the name of my niece. And so these are again, shoes that are based on real shoes that we, we don't own because couldn't afford them. But in the top left corner, you see the Converse. Those Converse have her actual shoelaces in them. So I took her shoelaces, I bleached them, and then I put them on there. So this is called Nikki's Closet. Next. So the next couple of quilts I'm going to show you are taking one idea and taking that idea and putting it, using it a little differently. This was a commission I did for my former uh, boss. So we talked about it. These are images, again, that I drew that are on this. It's called Our Legacy. So you can kind of see at the bottom and as they go up through there, the people become more modern. So it starts with um, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, and it, it kind of goes through the history of that. On the back of that quilt, which there isn't an image of, it has the names and it has their date of birth and their date of death. So next. So because I have made quilts in the past and, and people have gotten them and then I felt bad because then I didn't have a quilt anymore. So as I created her images, I created images for me. So this is again, an interpretation of the same kind of idea. So I have a few more faces than she has. And one day I will actually get the names and the dates on there, but I got lazy, go figure. But the names and the dates are on the back. Next. So this is this is a same idea. This image, I drew the image and then I interpreted it two different ways. So this is called Black Beauty. Next. And this is a, the exact same drawing rendered a little differently. 
So again, they look different, but they're based on the exact same pattern. This one is called looking forward. And again, taking the same idea, next. And you can, you can see some of the detail, next. And this is actually a picture of my son. So the images kind of face each other in the cameo. So I have hers looking one way, I have him looking the other way, and this is called, so the first one was looking forward and this is the future. So my daughter's actually two years older than her brother. So she was a first, he was a second, and the quilts are actually 10 years apart. Next. So this is the same idea. I had a drawing, I rendered it, and then I interpreted it one way. This one is called Goddess. And oh, and I didn't mention I have I had some quilts stolen. This quilt was stolen along with Spirit of the Woman and the the Mystical Journey. They they they're out in the universe somewhere. Somebody has them. I would really like to get them back. So if you see them, please let me know. So this is an image that I rendered next. And this is a close up in the detail. How I created her face is one way. Next. And so this is the exact same drawing. And again, how I use it as a pattern to render it a little differently. So the ideas for this one was a little different. The previous one, don't go back, was called Goddess. And this one is called Madonna. And the idea at the time was it's the same image, the same idea of woman and how it's portrayed or that divinity is portrayed differently in our society. So the next one. So this is a close up. And again, incorporating beading, look at it, kind of adding a different element to a two dimensional surface. Next. This is called Human Pieces. Um, it was for an actual, um, call for an entry and I never I never submitted it because I couldn't make up my mind which image, which one of those three pieces I wanted to use. And I ended up incorporating them all into simply one piece. So they're all puzzle pieces. And again, I think the idea that we are all different things, we all have different pieces that create the whole. The, the same idea, taking one idea or image and looking at it differently. Next. This is the detail. Next. And so thinking about how I got from my very first quilt to pieces I've created recently. Again, the idea of exploring two dimensions and then taking it and expanding it into a different dimension or bringing that image off of the surface. What does that look like? And I done more and more and more of that recently. This quilt was completed in 2015 and it, it follows the same idea. Um, this is called natural and later on you'll see some more details, but there's also beading in the design. I wanted the idea again of a portrait, but how do you bring the portrait off of the two dimensional surface? So I have ants on there. Years and years and years ago, I picked Black Eyed Susans off the side of the road and put them in a, a, a vase. And then two days later, I had ants everywhere. So the ants really, really like the flowers. Next. And again, this is a detail and the ants are embroidered. Next. And every time I see this image, I wanna pull that piece of thread off of it. Next. So natural is the first in a series. Next. This is the second one. It's called fly. So I have natural and I have fly. These are, if you came up in the seventies, you would know what these terms are and how they kind of apply to things. So you remember, everybody who remembers platform shoes, you remember what was fly. And of course it was always super fly. There are, every butterfly is three dimensional um, and there's over a hundred of those puppies. So, and on the back, which I don't have a picture of is pieces of butterfly fabric. Next. 
So again, all of the butterflies are three-dimensional. Again, exploring the idea of pulling that off of the, the two-dimensional surface. What does that look like? Next. Yeah, it's a lot. And the border is beaded. The border is heavily beaded. Next. Next. This is root. And this is the last one in that particular series. So again, if you think about natural, natural, we had naturals. Yeah, and if you went to sleep without braiding it up, you'd be mad. Then there's fly, and now there's roots. And again, it's three-dimensional. The border of this particular quilt is heavily beaded. And you can see, and actually there are different things in here, and you probably won't be able to see them because I don't think I have pictures of them. There's a butterfly, there's a ladybug, there's a spider, there's a spider web, and there's actually a door. And I don't have a picture of the door. Next. And you can, again, see how the leaves come off of the surface and their branches. This piece is actually incredibly heavy. Next. And you can kind of see the spider web. Next. So again, um, all of the leaves. And then you can see the butterfly. OK, well, I guess we're up to Q&A now. All right, I'm going to open up the Q&A and if any questions occur to anyone, feel free to add your question to the Q&A and it'll be addressed. Um, so first question I have for Francis Porter and the question is, are the letters hand sewn or machine sewn on your quilt? The, the uh, letters are all machine sewn. Thank you. So next I have a question that was directed for Terry. And the question was, was your aunt surprised? Um, and if you need any reminder of what that could be in reference to, I could ask the, we could ask the person who asked the question to elaborate as well. I'm sure it was, they were talking about the church lady, the church lady quilt. Um, she was, very surprised. I mean, she had no idea that I was making it. And all of the images reminded her of herself. And we gave it to her at her little birthday celebration. Um, at a, I think it was that we went to. And that quilt sits in her living room right now. Uh, not that she's having any visitors, but if someone ever comes over, they'll be able to see it. But she loved Great, thank you, Terry. Um, the next question from the same person was directed for Lakita. Lakita, um, have you always done calligraphy? Yes, I have always done calligraphy, um, but I've always drawn too. And another question for you, um, what's the next series you're working on? Oh, I actually, I was a part of the 12 by 12 and I didn't show those pieces. Um, I have a series of anatomical hearts um, and there are right now, I think there are 20 of them. That would technically be the next series. They are, they're relatively small. 12 by 12 is actually not that big in the quilting world. Um, and then how to kind of get them all together. Great, thank you. Um... And this is a question for everybody, if you want to kind of take it one by one. Um, how many of the presenters long arm themselves? Does someone else long arm for you? I, everything I do is by hand. I do my own stuff. I don't send my quilts out. I, I hand piece, hand applique, hand. So all of my stuff is hand. So I don't have anything that's machine quilted. Everything you saw, I created by hand. Um, so that, that's, I don't do that. We have these, we have the incredible ladies in the guild. And my first quilt was long arm, was by Teresa Whalen. And I have learned how to do long arm. However, I don't own a long arm so that I quilt on machine or 
I have my quilts professionally done by, again, Guild member Pat Bailey. And I've also used another long arm quilter, Melissa Quilter happens to be her name, but I don't do long arm quilting myself. I do machine quilting, but not long arm. And, and for me, when I first started out, I was sending everything out to um, the local quilt store and they were doing the long arm for me. And the, the very last quilt that I showed, which was the wedding quilt, I had that one professionally done, custom quilted. But, it, but in between that, I, I learned how to do my own machine quilting. And so I either do it on my sewing machine or I have a sweet 16 that I do it on. And so the, um, the 20 by 20, the quilt gilts 20 by 20, the quilting divas, I did that one myself. So I'm, I'm not great at doing it. I think it's one of the things that I'm going to focus on, you know, in the next couple of quilts is getting better at free motion quilting myself. Great, thank you everyone. Um, next question, all of your work is beautiful. Do you copyright it or make pictures to sell? Do you keep a notebook for inspiration and spur of the moment thoughts? Well, I'll, I'll start. Um, I just recently started to keep pictures or put them all together of all the quilts that I've made. And at the encouragement of one of my friends who said, oh no, you should, you should have a biography. And so I started doing that. I, I haven't copyrighted anything, um, just, just haven't done that at all. But I, but I am starting to put them together pictures. But also what's interesting is I like to do, when I quilt, I take progress photos so how I started in the beginning, you know, maybe some photos in the middle, it, it just, just to show the journey that I'm on. And, and for now, it's just for me personally, I just keep it on my computer, but um, that's how I do it. And so it's funny because you don't realize all the quilts that you've made until you start looking for the pictures. And then you wish there were some that you had taken pictures of because they're gone. You remember doing it, but it, it's been given away. I use my cell phone and my tablet to photograph some of my quilts, but the one thing I have found is that they're all over the place. And I really, someday, I'm gonna learn how to put them in an album, although Apple has put some in an album, but not all in an album. And I've gotta learn how to do that. I'm not technology competent, let me say it that way. I um, I don't I I have designs things that I've designed images ideas some of them I've gotten as far as um, drafting them out but I have way too many ideas and so I don't I don't really I don't keep track of them in that that particular manner. I have a lot of pictures. I The one thing I can say about cell phones is I do like having the ability to take the process pictures. That's great. Not having to wait to have them developed because that's how it used to be in the old days. So I have a lot of pictures um, that are actual physical pictures. And then I have the digital images. And like you, Francis, I got them everywhere. And to get them together for this, it was a challenge. What I, but, but I, don't, I don't take good pictures. Um, some of the pictures that you saw were professional photographs. I will pay to have some of my stuff professionally photographed because I'm simply not good at it. And I was really excited to find out that some of the quilts that I had that were stolen, I actually have professional pictures of them. And it's nice to be able to say, "Ooh, I've I've forgotten about that," and I have a lot of I have a lot of quilts, and I have a lot of images of my quilts. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that I just never took pictures of, and it's just gone. So, I it's nice to have. It, it is nice to have. I wasn't able to take the uh, watermelon floor picture so that I could share that with you. So, but I did have the, the newspaper 
And so I simply took my cell phone and made a copy from the newspaper. So it's not really very colorful, but the actual quilt itself looks like a slice of watermelon in many of the blocks. Thank you. Um, next question. Could the quilters tell us their favorite work done by someone else? Mm. <laughs> that, that is tough. Um, I have so many favorites. And so you're going to, you're going to get us in trouble if we have to just choose one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but there, but um there happens to be one, and she knows that I love this quilt, but Jackie Houston did one called Hands Up, Don't Shoot, and it was part of the neighborhoods coming together, and I love that quilt. I wish she would <laughs> give it to me or let me buy it, but that's that's one, and I'm sure I'll think of a whole lot more, um, but that's that's one that just resonates with me, and I, I love it. I love a lot, a lot of quilts, but you, you asked for one. I fully agree. And I have to say, and I don't recall the name, but Marion Coleman did one of the big firestorm, I think was about 1989 or so or whatever year. Mm -hmm. And it was also in uh, the, the uh, quilts around Oakland. And I love that quilt. And when you see it, there is no question in your mind as to what you're looking at. It really is that fire storm. That is actually my favorite. Oh. Recently, I've seen Bisa Butler. She has some very interesting quilts. I like hers. And Faith Ringo, um, you know, she has some wonderful pieces as well. There are a lot of, there are a lot of, I don't have a, favorite quilt or favorite quilter. If it's colorful and bright, um, there's an excellent chance I'm gonna be drawn to it. Great, thank you. Uh, Laquita, we have a question for you. How long did roots take you? And this is from Diane. She says, I'm fascinated by your handiwork. Roots, there's actually a kind of they're, they're all kind of overlapping. Um, I am not a monogamous project kind of person. Um, as something hits me, I'll start working at it. Work will happen or something will happen and it, and it will stop. Um, approximately two years, but really maybe if I work straight through, it's one thing, but, but I'm always juggling product projects I'm always in the middle of something actually my real thing right now is knitting so I got like four knitting projects and that's just that that's that's just the one thing my niece who wanted the shoe quilt she's pregnant so she's got baby quilts coming down the pike knitting blanket I mean so approximately I would guess and say approximately two years um technically from beginning to end it might be more it might be less but um working on it on and off, it, it was about two years. Thank you. I have another question for you. Um, do your leaves have interfacing to give them structure? So it's funny, a couple of years ago, I did a class at the Guild on how to construct it. So to, a two-dimensional a two dimension, two element is flat. When you're trying to create something that's three-dimensional, then you kind of have to take different things into account. Some of the leaves actually have wire in them. So it's the wire is placed on like a Tim text or a pellon, a stiff pellon, and then you cut the leaves out. There are actually several, you can like with anything else, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. So for the leaves that have wire in them, you wire them up, and then you, you put the fabric on the top, you, depending on the shape of the leaf, you kind of sew around it. Um, but there is indeed, for almost all of them, there are leaves that are actually appliqued onto the face. And so those are flat. The other leaves that are dimensional, they do have um, like a Temtex or a Pellon, a stiff craft uh, interfacing in between. Some of them have wire, some of them don't. So it really just depends. Um, but most of them, yes, most of them do. And then the leaves, 
are attached to branches. There are actually branches on there. And the branches are heavier than the leaves, but the, the branches also have wire in them that allowed me to shape them. So again, all that, that makes it heavier. It makes it heavy. And on the entire back of roots, it's a whole, I have a whole piece of reinforcement because if it were just the fabric, it would actually lean forward. So I've had to put, there's a big piece of uh, pellet or text, ten text on the back to, to hold, kind of hold it stiff because it, it really is heavy. Thank you. Um, Terry, I have a question for you. What is a sweet 16? Oh, it is, it is a mid arm. They call it a mid arm. So a long arm quilting machine, you're standing up and you're, you know, you're quilting your, your quilt. A mid arm, you sit down and it's like a sewing machine, but it's a little bit larger and it has a larger throat space. And moving the fabric with you, moving the quilt with your hand to um, pre-motion quilt it. But it sits, but you sit down. Great, thank you. I have a question for everyone. As you've moved from traditional to more dimensional works and crafts over the years, what do you see yourself exploring next in terms of your pieces? Mm. So I'll start. I, I have so many ideas in my head of things that I want to do. Um, just like Laquita said, you know, you, you stop thinking about them because there's just so many things floating around. But I, I would like to try my hand at using more um, African fabric in my quilts. And I also am interested in, in doing a little bit more free motion quilting by machine. I, I just don't do a lot of work by hand. You know, but I explore free motion quilting a little bit more. I still like doing the art quilts as well. And I just think there's so many things out there to explore that tomorrow I might feel different and I'll just try it. You just, you just try everything. I, you, uh, Terry just mentioned African fabrics and you may note that um, with me, there's African fabrics in the quilt that's behind me now. And that is fabric by Julie Karn. I love making quilts with African fabrics because I love the colors. Mm -hmm. And I have found that the quilts that I donate for fundraisers have actually had more people who at a silent auction or at a raffle will be more competitive when they see the colorful African fabrics. However, I'm now using a lot of panels because now a lot of the young people whom I know are having babies. And so I'd like to make a quilt with someone in mind. Uh, and who am I going to welcome into the world with this quilt? So I use a lot of panels that I, but then I do all of the machine quilting myself. And I do a lot of borders that has uh, other patterns that I use in the border around them. So that's where I am for the most part. But who knows? I'm actually awaiting a class to be given by Laquita. I would love to learn her, her technique of three-dimensional. You can't see it in the photographs, but they are awesome. That is all I can say. And I'm awaiting the end of COVID-19, shelter in place, so we can meet again in person to person. I have asked her this before, and I'm throwing it out there for her to hear. Aquita? Oh, Thank you, Miss Porter, for throwing me under the bus. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll certainly see what's coming up. Um, I, um, I'm going to retire this year. Yay, yay to me. Um, so that will certainly free up some of my time. And, and 
not totally averse to the idea of, of showing people what I do. Um, I'm not the most structured quilter, um, sharp points, and I have, I actually didn't show them, but I have pieces um, that literally have thousands and thousands of, of little tiny pieces sewed together. Um, and, and for some insane reason, I do do that. Um, but I'm not, I'm not the most technical quilter. I'm like, does that, does that look like it could work? I could do that. Um, in terms of where my work is going, I, I'm not sure. I promised my children before I left the earth, I would try and use up the 20 containers of fabric I currently have in storage. That's not what's in my house. But then I still have like beads and then I have several containers of yarn. Um, I actually have polymer clay that I haven't explored yet. Um, if, if there is a colorful craft item, I probably own it. I have a lot of stuff. So my plan is to use up my stuff as much as I can. Um, and, and, and is whatever that looks like, then that's what that looks like. Between the beads, the fabric, the yarn, the floss, the, all of that, I, I got, I got, I got a lot of stuff. So my plan, my creative plan is to use as much of it as I can for as long as I can. That's, that's my own, my own creative drive. I don't have any, anything in particular cause I'm gonna go squirrel. You know, I'm knitting one minute in the course of a day during the pandemic when I was home, I quilted, needle pointed, um, knit, um, and did beating all in one day. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm squirrel like that. Thanks everyone. Um, next question, how do you manage your creativity? How do you manage feeling overwhelmed? How do you handle feeling like you will have enough time for all of your ideas? There isn't enough time for all of my ideas. Um, there there's just simply isn't because I'm always getting new ones. I see something else and then I'm, again, I go squirrel. I was like, oh, um, I actually wish I had a learned I learned how to crochet when I was 10. So that that's over, that's a long time ago. We won't say how many. That's, that's, that's older than Alana. She's not older. I've been crocheting longer than that. So, but the point is, um, there just isn't. I think people have said to me, and on the back of my heritage, there are these words. People say, oh, well, you must have a lot of patience. And I really, really don't. Um, Raising children requires patience. Working for the government for 27 years requires patience. When you are doing what you love, when you're doing what excites you, when you're creating your passion, it doesn't require patience. Now it does require time, but it doesn't require patience. So when you, when you determine for yourself what is important to you, then those are the things that you seek. Those are the things that you run behind. Those are the things that you make a priority for you. So for me, I want, I'm, I'm gonna always have too many ideas. Like I said, my goal is to use up my materials and hopefully not, not buy more. Um, how, I, want, I want to spend my time doing what's important to me, which is why, I think in light of the pandemic, in light of um, the fact that once you close your eyes for the final time, you, you don't get a do-over. So how do, you, how do you make most of the time that you have? What are the things that are important? And this is my commercial, my PSA. I'm gonna get on my soapbox and then I'll get off. We have a lot of things that are distracting. Pinterest is distracting. Facebook is distracting. Instagram is, is it distracts from the time that I have. I don't own a TV and I don't watch TV because it's a distraction. There are so many things that, that our modern life feeds us that we don't always step back and take the time to, to determine for ourselves, A, what is important and B, am I gonna really make that a priority? So it isn't, it isn't a matter of having enough time. It's a matter of prioritizing the time that I have and making sure that I make the best use of my time. Yay, retirement. 
I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> I would have I'm listening to Rikita. Look, I'm sorry, Laquita. Uh, I think all of us could open up a fabric store or a craft <laughs> store because I don't know of a quilter who doesn't have more fabric than they'll ever use in this lifetime. Uh, I have tried to use my stash in all of my quilts recently because I'm simply deciding that I'm not going to purchase another piece of fabric. And yet I find myself using <laughs> Amazon and Google and one more piece of fabric because I need that color. Uh, but what <laughs> my goal now uh, is, as I have done over the years, is to make a quilt for members of my family, which is not too large. However, I make a quilt and give it to them, something to remember me by. And so I'm still trying to get to many friends and a few relatives that I haven't gotten to yet, uh, something to remember Francis by. And after all, you have to think about how old I am. By now, it's, you know, if you saw and you registered, you know how old I am. Okay. <laughs> I don't, I don't think that um, most quilters shortage of creative ideas. I mean, every time you open up a magazine and, and I do happen to go on Facebook, uh, you know, there's a couple of great Facebook groups, um, Black Girls Quilt, Quilts, I think is one, but I see so many things and I make a mental note to myself, oh, I want to do that one day. Oh, I want to try that another day. And I probably have different types of projects going on at one time, usually three. And there's probably three more that are that I'm thinking about doing. Um, I agree with Laquita. It's there really isn't enough time in the day, but it's how you use that time. Um, and you know, whether it's in it 15 minutes a day or an hour a day just to do something creative, that makes me happy. Um, and if I'm not creating something, if I'm not making something or touching fabric or thinking about a quilt, then I'm not a happy person. <laughs> I, I like to be, even though I don't create every day. Great, thank you. Um, for Mrs. Porter, do you have a piece you are working on now and what is it about? I have just completed a quilt in black and white and yellow for a grand, a great grandniece because her quilt that she owns now was made when she was a little girl in dance classes. And so I made this memory quilt for her then. But now that she's a young adult, she needs a new one. And some of her favorite colors happens to be black and white, and her mom said a bit of yellow. And so I have just completed that one, but I'm about to start on another that will go to a friend in Southern California that will include a logo from the University of Southern California, Fight On, and their colors. But these are things in the future, but like all others, we usually work on more than one project at a time. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of difficult for me to say. Great, and I see um, one question that was part of the chat. Um, someone wrote, great words of wisdom on using our time in the pandemic as well as TV and social media as a distraction. Thank you. How about listening to music while quilting? Yes, I, I listen to music while I quilt. Um, I, I sometimes have the TV in the background just because noise, music helps me in my creative process. But I love music, especially Aretha Franklin, James Brown, <laughs> and then some jazz or opera, but love it. I usually have the TV on. Laquita doesn't own one. <laughs> I own four. 
the TVs are all old. I don't watch them. I use them for the sound mm -hmm. and mostly game shows, but also the political channels, CNN and MSNBC. I've been listening to what was going on, but I'm really not listening. It's just that the sound is there to keep me company. I, the music is almost as bad as the shoes. On my laptop right now, I have approximately 65 days of music. So <laughs> I like almost all genres with the exception of country. Um, so I, I, got, I, have, uh, I have a lot of music and that music is my background noise. You know, people like, I don't, I, pre I prefer the music, but that is, that's my background noise is music. Thank you so much, everyone. I don't have any more Q&A questions in that section. Um, if anyone else has any last questions that they'd like to ask while we have these wonderful, talented women here, it'd be great. Um, or if any of our panelists would like to share any additional thoughts they've had or inspirations that have come up since some of the questions that were asked. That would be great as well. Just, just a thought. Um, when I first started quilting, I was so intimidated by the quilt police. Let's just put it that way, the quilt police. And I would just encourage anyone, especially if they're on a journey and whether it's a new journey into traditional quilting or a new journey beginning and in, into art quilting or or for me it was you know embroidery machine embroidery or even free motion quilting get the quilt police out of your head don't think about perfection um, just think about enjoying the process getting it done and there are so many people out there that will help you, whether it's part of the Oakland Guild. I mean, there, there are ladies that I could just call or email or text and they'll help. There's, you know, my friends on Facebook, they'll help you. Just get over being intimidated and just do it. And if it doesn't work out, just toss it aside. And maybe, you know, down the road, you can, you know, reuse that particular piece. Or you do something and you, you look at it and you say, I don't like that. I'll never do it again. It might be a technique you don't like. You tried it, you don't like it, but just, just do it and don't be intimidated and enjoy the process. I, I agree with Terry. I think um, because again, I, there was a time, it was a brief time, but it was a time when I really wanted to looking at all of the quilts that people do, the kinds of quilts that people got awards for. And I was like, I can do that. But if it sucks all the joy out to make it technically correct, if it's if if you don't enjoy that process, then then what what is the point of that? I have a job, the job pays my bills. I don't I don't have to when I'm being creative, I can do whatever I want. And I think that is the thing that has kept me creative for as long as it has been. When I make something, I don't have to follow the rules. I don't have to make it the way that they did it. I don't have to do it the way that they said. It is a place of absolute freedom for me because if it's ugly, if they don't like it, it's okay because it's mine. And whatever I make is mine. And um, I think sometimes in, in as social human beings, we, we look at other people's stuff and we kind of, oh, that's so nice. But I'm at an age, not quite as old as Miss Porter, but <laughs> where I, where I grew up. <laughs> one day, you're my goal. See, you talk about me, you're my goal. But when you get to be a certain point, you can say, you know what? That is amazing. That is fabulous. I want to do that. And, and that... That's, that's another stage in, in the development of a human. I, I have seen amazing quilts. I don't want to make them. I have seen people do stuff that's like, I'm like, wow, but I don't want to make that because that's not my creativity. That's not why I can admire it. 
it's not, it's not something that I want to do. I want to explore all of the stuff that's stuck in my head. How can I pull my images out? How can I look at what you did and say, that's cool, that's fabulous, but I don't want to make that quilt. Now, I like your technique, or how did you do that? How did they do that? I want to know how they did that, but I don't want to make, I don't want to make that. I want to make what's in my head, what's a part of me. And um, it, I think if you, if people can look at things, admire them, and then say, I'm going to, I'm going to make my thing for me, then that, that to me is like, kind of like the gold in being creative. I'm going to make my thing. I'm going to express myself. I'm going to use applique. I'm going to use quilting. I'm going to use beading. I'm going to use embroidery. I'm going to use a long arm, I, whatever it is. When you can take that and say, I'm going to mm -hmm. take that technique, that thing, that color, that fabric and express myself. I think that's the goal in being creative. Right. All right. Laquita mentioned uh, making mistakes. My first instructor, as I mentioned, was the late Joy Johnson, who was the Guild's second president. And Joy would say to me when I made a mistake, and trust me, I made many, it's your quilt. You can do whatever you want. And it doesn't matter what somebody else thinks. Or she would say, well, the little pixie did that, not you. And I'd go right on quilting. And I also mentioned that my first quilt at the Underground Railroad that was juried by the fairs, jurors, uh, really did make me feel like they had stuck me with pins. But I decided, no, nobody's gonna do that to me. I'm going to enter another, and they may criticize me, whatever critique they make, but it'll not be the same mistakes again. And so I've used that as a basis for whatever I do. And now at this stage, when my points are, are clipped off, or when my square is not quite square, hey, you're getting a free quilt, okay? <laughs> so be it. <laughs> no bother, no bother, doesn't bother me anymore. I think when you get over worrying about what people think about your quilts or whether or not it's good enough, that, that gives you the freedom to be very creative because any, I don't even like to say mistake, but anything you do is part of the, it's part of the process. So don't worry, just be free. I agree. Wow, that's such good advice for any creative practice probably any life practice, but um, I do have another question to ask you all. Uh, where do you get your fabric locally? <laughs> I, have shirt, oh, Francis. I have a t-shirt that when I visited the Texas Quilt Museum, that was given to me after I led the tours. And it says, I will not buy fabric because any place from Walmart, Joanne, on Amazon, any place, if I see a piece of fabric I like, that's why my stash is so big. Because I thought, I'll use that someday, so I'll get a, a yard of that. But I don't have any particular place. Uh, there's one store in, uh, in Berkeley, I'm trying to remember the name of it, Ooh, 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 that I took classes. New anyway, pieces? New pieces. Mm -hmm. New pieces. I went to new pieces for a long time. New pieces, I bought a lot of them. And then there's one on Shattuck Avenue. That, Stone. Uh, Stone. 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 Yeah, I buy, I, I buy fabric film. Well, actually now, since COVID, I don't buy anything except uh, through Amazon because I don't get out. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I'm here in Fairfield and we have a couple of a couple of local quilt stores um, in town and and I do encourage you to support the quilt stores because if we don't they're going to close up and the only places you're going to have to shop are Amazon and not I don't I don't even shop with Amazon there's a lot of uh, online stores that are out there but I think most of uh, the quilters 
have stashes and stashes and, <laughs> and more, stash. more fabric than you need. And but it's always that one piece that is missing and you need to run to the store to get, you know, that just that one. <laughs> but I don't I don't want to shop anymore. I don't <laughs> need anymore. <laughs> mm. I haven't shopped for fabric in over 10 years. And I still, um, I buy yarn now and I buy beads now, um, but I don't, I don't shop for fabric. Um, not the way that I used to. I haven't done that in, in, in over a good 10 or 12 years. I don't, I don't buy fabric the way that I used to. I, I'm trying so very hard <laughs> to use up what I own. That, that's what I'm trying to do. Um, so I, the, the, the stores that um, Francis mentioned, New Pieces, Stone Mountain Daughter, Bay Quilts. Um, there's also a place called Recrafters and it's in Alameda and she has an amazing mix of stuff. Um, yarn, beads, fabric, all kinds of craft stuff. So she's in Alameda and it's Viscamic. So she has, she has a lot of stuff. But yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't buy fabric the way that I used to. Mm -hmm. Someone in the chat group mentioned a, a Facebook group online store called Quilting with Soul. And, and they have fabulous fabrics, great prices, great quality, and excellent customer service. So there, there are a lot of local places and online stores everywhere. Well, great. I, uh, I just want to take this opportunity to thank Loretta, Francis, Laquita, Terry, all of you again for being here today and sharing all of your insight and wisdom. Um, You're quite welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. yes, thank, you. thank you. It was interesting. And with that, I think that we have reached the end of our talk. Um, Thank you everyone for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm.